All right, welcome. Thanks for being with me tonight. And I apologize that I got started late. Um, but welcome to our Tuesday spinal, uh, spinal workshop. And I always like to take a moment to pause and thank you for say, taking the time to be here today. Um, I think that there's a lot of other things that we could all be doing on a Tuesday night. Um, and you are here with us tonight. And what we find is people who show up to workshops, they tend to improve and respond 30 to 70% more so than those who don't. And what we see happen is you start to learn and understand more about your body. You start to hold yourself accountable to doing things that are most right as it relates to your health. Specifically, when we're in the chiropractic office, your spine and brain. And um, I think between Dr. Kristen and I, we can both agree that when it comes to low back pain and talking about pain in general, it's a very low energetic state to be in. Um, and we find that we get really inspired when we cover other topics. But the reality is um, people show up to a chiropractor because they are in pain. And so uh, I find that it's really pertinent to have a conversation around understanding low back pain the causes, if you are given a diagnosis, what does that mean? Uh, and then how can you resolve it? Um, and so there's a lot of material today that I've got packed into this workshop. Um, if we get through it, great. If not, that's okay too. But I like to start off here with really understanding low back pain. I mean, worldwide, it's the single leading cause of disability. And it's the most common reason for missing work. In fact, back pain is the second mo most common reason for uh, somebody visiting a doctor's office, uh, outnumbered only by an upper respiratory infection. Half of all working Americans admit to having back pain symptoms a year. And experts estimate that 80% of the population will experience a back problem at some time in their lives. Um, most cases of back pain are mechanical, we'll get into that. Uh, but it basically means it's not caused by a serious condition. And we spend a lot of money on back pain, $50 billion a year. And that uh, also add in the lost wages, de decreased productivity. Uh, this figure rises to $100 billion. So this costs us a lot of money. So uh, that's where I really want to dive into understanding just our lumbar spine or low back spine. Now, this is a chart that goes through phases of degeneration. And if you've been through your report with us, you know that we broke this down. Uh, and sometimes we go through it so quickly uh, that it's not always well understood. But I want you to understand that when you're looking at this um, picture here, go to the far left. And this is really looking at a healthy lumbar spine. So your lumbar spine should have five vertebra. So can you guys see my mouse? No, you can't. Okay. So five vertebra, five, four, three, two, one, five, four, three, two, one. In between each vertebra should be a nice, thick, fluffy disc space. Okay. And that disc space acts as a shock absorber. Um, and it's well hydrated. It's like a jelly donut. It's uh, connective tissue. The outer is very fibrous and thick, very tough material. On the inside is a jelly gelatinous um, center. So what's that? Juicy. It's a juicy. We want our disc to be nice and juicy. And then you should see nice square vertebra and they should be stacked on each other. And so uh, when we deviate from this healthy structure, uh, that's where we start to get into some of the diagnosis that uh, we'll go over, but you'll get into hearing things like disc herniations, uh, degenerative disc disease or joint disease, facet um, arthritis. Um, we can talk about deformities and scoliosis and that sort of thing. Um, but I really want you to understand this is what a normal cervical spine should look like. And I don't reference back to this normal. So if you all want to take a picture if you're at home and take a picture of this normal or we'll keep it in our mind's eye for when we're going through the next few slides. But let's just talk about uh, more of an acute scenario where you would have low back pain. The most common cause of low back pain is a sprain strain, a pulled muscle or ligament. A strain refers to a tearing of a muscle 
Okay, a sprain refers to a tearing or damage of a ligament. A ligament connects bone to bone uh, and um, typically have a muscle, a tendon to a ligament. Uh, so <clears throat> a sprain strain can happen suddenly or it can happen over time due to repetitive movement. So I want you to think about uh, lifting a he heavy object or twisting the spine while lifting. An example is shoveling, right? Uh, a lot of times we see the winter time, we have a big snowfall. People aren't warming up their bodies before they go do some heavy lifting like shoveling snow. And we get a lot of injuries from that. Sudden movements are putting too much stress on a low back that's not able to handle that stress load uh, like a fall. Um, poor posture over time, sports injury, especially when it comes to twisting or sports where there's major impacts. Uh, and then we have motor vehicle accidents. In fact, the most common injury of a motor vehicle accident is a whiplash. Um, most common cause of low back pain in terms of acute situation. Uh, and you can address this. Um, in fact, if anyone is in a motor vehicle accident, whether they feel anything or not, the first thing we say is you need to get checked because typically symptoms for this can show up later on. And we're finding that even minor car accidents where there's as low as five miles per hour can have an impact to our structure because that momentum needs to be absorbed somewhere and it's absorbed into our car and absorbed into our bodies and so typically if we have a sprain strain that's not addressed appropriately it becomes a chronic condition especially if it's a scenario where it's more of a repetitive stress that happened over time that you're continually stressing the body and if that's not addressed then you know, this back pain uh, will become more chronic in nature. So enter in chronic low back pain. So just so you are aware, chronic, the definition of chronic is something that's been, that is present for three months or longer. So not a lot of time. A lot of times people think, oh, I have back pain and it's been around for a couple of years. It's fine. It's no big deal. No, it is a big deal. When we're getting past that three month mark, this means the body is under stress. And when the body's under stress, it's promoting our body's natural healing process. And over time, that leads to a degenerative change, like a disc problem, like a joint problem, like an irritated nerve root. We'll get into those things. And I want you to keep this in mind. Some people think it promotes a body's natural healing process. And at some point it's too much for that body and you see breakdown. And I will argue that the breakdown takes place when breakdown occurs, it is an intelligent process. Is It, it is the body's way to respond and handle long-term chronic stress to a system that is not in shape in any way to handle it. Okay, so we'll go back to that. But I just want you to see there's stages of degenerative change. Uh, again, if you look at this far left, you see a nice, healthy spinal vertebra. And these are lumbar vertebra. Lumbar vertebra tend to be thicker, bigger. Uh, they are carrying more weight down into our low back. Uh, those discs tend to be thicker too. But you see nice, healthy discs. You see nice square vertebra. Now, when you get into phase one degenerative change, that's where you start to get changes of the curve. Okay, I'm going to pop back here. You start to get changes of this curve. Okay. And so the curve looks different than this C shape curve right here. So, phase one, and let me back up even more. So, our spine was designed to maintain its structural integrity for between 90 and 125 years before breakdown. That doesn't mean at 90 we go kaput. That means at 90, that's when we anticipate the breakdown starting. I've seen 12 year olds with phase two degeneration. We live in a very stressful world and we're not taught to take care of our spine from the beginning of life on a daily basis throughout life. How does that happen to a 12 year old? So the question was, how does that happen to a 12 year old? And I would look at our modern, you know, just our modern lifestyle. Our kiddos are on technology very early on. Not only that, they're sitting in school for hours on end, but they used to get out for recess. They used to move their bodies. They used to be engaged in, in many different activities that were physical in nature, and now we're much more sedentary. Amongst many other things, I think that's a loaded question, but great question. So in order for phase one degeneration or any degeneration to be present, 
on an x-ray, it takes anywhere between five and 30 years. So for phase one to show up, which is the only phase that's reversible, it means it's been around for years, if not decades. And so for phase two to show up, which, which typically we see thinning of a disc, okay? Because when we change that curve, right? We got our spine over here. If a natural curve in our spine, right? And we add those compressive forces, our spine is designed to be in this state. We start to change the curve where we start to see rounding or, or flattening. We add those compressive forces and that acts on our spine differently. It starts to break down that spine. And so we see compression through the disc space. And then further degenerative change, we start to see um, bone spurring show up, which is kind of like a callus on your finger. Body wants to go in and reinforce that. And then we turn into an osteophyte and then it's just bony buildup of a very unstable, unhealthy internal state, which we'll look at some more x-rays here. These are too small. So understand, Chronic is three months or more, but these processes that we're going to go over take years and decades, okay? And most of the time, if we go to, um, you know, <clears throat> our American culture, pain shows up. When do we believe the problem started? With, with the pain. And if we dive into really understanding more about what's going on in your low back, we see, oh no, I realize the pain just started, but it's been around much longer. So let's talk about the diagnosis of osteoarthritis. This is the most commonly overdiagnosed or misdiagnosed um, arthritis, but it is an overuse arthritis due to repetitive motions, typically could be job or sports related. So if we have a carpenter, electrician, uh, working at a desk technology, um, but it's really wear and tear. The body cannot heal damage to the joint as fast as the damage is taking place. And it's specifically to your hyaline cartilage um, and it causes inflammation and pain. I don't want to spend a ton of time on osteoarthritis because I wanted to get into other, um, <laughs> other diagnoses here. But whales and dolphins, they get arthritis. We think that gravity and, and um, will is the major impactor to bringing on arth arthritic changes within our bodies, but it's not a result of wear and tear. It's a result of ab abnormal biomechanical motion. So if we take, you know, gravity out of it and we have, you know, we've seen these mammals who are in water all day and don't have the gravity working on us and don't have the stress to their joints, um, if they do have biomechanical or um, what we call subluxation going on within the joint, the joint's not moving appropriately or it's moving too much or um, it's not moving at all, that causes biomechanical issues. And that's where we start to see um, these arthritic changes in the body. So more commonly, when we get osteoarthritis as a diagnosis, it's more commonly a subluxation degeneration, meaning a joint that loses motion and it breaks down because it's not getting the blood flow to that area. I mean, our joints are not as mobile and movable. Our joints in our spine don't move like our shoulder moves or our knee moves or our hips move. Um, discs are, they don't get a ton of blood supply. So when we get healthy movement in the spine that makes sure you're getting healthy nutrition and blood flow to the area. Um, and so if you have subluxation or you have poor movement or abnormal movement that contributes to arthritic changes in your spine. And so enter in some of these diagnoses that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, lumbar disc herniation. Okay, a lumbar disc herniation is specifically to the disc Okay, and it means that that jelly-like center of that lumbar disc breaks out through that outer fibrous layer and it's starting to ir irritate a nerve, whether it's the spinal cord or the nerve root exiting out of that spine. So if you look at this MRI, so this, this middle picture is an MRI. Um, MRI is great at looking at soft tissue. It's great at looking at disc. It's great at looking at the cord. The one to the right is an x-ray. We've all seen an x-ray. 
Um, if you look at L5S1, okay, which is right here, L5S1, here's L5S1 into the sacrum. For you guys at home, I'm looking at L5S1, so I'm looking at this disk space, same here. When you have that compression over time, it starts to push out to where that disc should be. This is where the real disc herniation is happening in this picture. That, that Here's where the disc herniation is happening. This is where the cord is right here. So when you are diagnosed with a disc herniation, this is showing up in the cord, okay? And when you impact the cord, you could potentially have both sides of the body impacted because the cord is central. It's not to the right or the left. Those are the nerves that are exiting out from the cord. Um, but this can cause major stress to a system. And although x-rays don't tell us disc health, we can make a pretty good clinical, you know, um, clinically anticipate that when you look at L5S1, you see that level of compression on that disc, there's likely some disc bulging. And disc bulging is that jelly is pushing out on those outer um, fibrous layers, but it hasn't been, um, you know, released into the area, it doesn't take up space and impact that, that nerve. Um, and so again, the question is always, why is that present? You know, if you look at this x-ray, our medical counterparts will say, this is normal aging. And I will argue that it is not normal aging because look at this disc right above L5S1. Look at this L4, L5 disc. Look at how thick and fluffy that one is. How old is that one compared to L5S1? Are they the same age? Is one older than the other? So we have to get it out of our mindset that we are designed to just over time, um, you know, experience less health and vitality. We are just going to break down as we get older. You know, these x-rays that I'm holding up, they're a smattering of anywhere of somebody into their 20s all the way up into their 60s. Um, and so this is a process of poor movement, L5S1, poor biomechanical processes and how that spine is fed good nerve supply. And over time we get compression. And at some point, likely a disc bulging, some point it could become a disc herniation if this person doesn't address it, okay? Now let's go into degenerative disc disease. Now degenerative disc disease, it could be degenerative joint disease as well. This is where multiple discs lose hydration and break down over time. Uh, and these discs are unable to resist the force and the force is transferred to the disc wall, weakening that wall over time and potentially leading to disc herniation. This is multiple levels and it can contribute to stenosis and we'll go over what that means in a second. Um, but understand when we're seeing degenerative disc disease or joint disease, this indicates it's a progression in how your spine is degenerating over time. So it's just progression in time where this has likely been around for a lot longer, okay? And I will go back to this person, and this is where everyone is different because we could see somebody who has degenerative disc disease and their pain is a two out of 10. And we could see somebody with a disc herniation and their pain could be, you know, 10 out of 10. One is not better than the other one is, it's just individual. And yet we're always looking at how can we assess and support a healthier structure, spine, low back. Okay. So let's talk about facets for a second. You can have facet joint dysfunction. Um, there are two facet joints between each disc um, that allow for motion in the lumbar spine. So um, if you look right here, you see L2, L3, L4, L5. These are where they're fitting together. So you can see the joints right here. That's where L4 fits into L5, okay? This is where L4, or here if we're looking at L2 and L3, they fit into each other. And there's a transition that happens in your lumbar spine where your thoracic um, vertebra um, are more like this, 
like they're attached more like this thoracic vertebra and then as you transition down to your lumbar spine they start attaching more um, this direction so when you have transitional stages through your spine it those are areas that can be predisposed to stress okay um, but you have a lot of nerve fibers around those facets so uh, if the facets aren't moving as well um, again we could have dysfunction subluxation uh, and you could in fact have pain and inflammation low back pain from that it's a different way we might adjust somebody as opposed to somebody who has uh, more disc problems or we see a lot of people respond to adjustments similar adjustments in both of them um, you can also have just like in the facets you can have your sacroiliac joint you can have dysfunction there now i've got this picture here here are your sacroiliac joints right here I don't have a normal, so I'm sorry, but you've got one on both sides, okay? And this is actually um, stage three sacroiliac dysfunction. But if you look along these joint spaces right here, that should be a pretty clear joint space. And you see all this white stuff right here? That's bony buildup or formation to start protecting um, the lack of stability and lack of movement within that spine. So right along here. So sometimes you can have, you know, joint dysfunction happening through there. And again, the question is, why is it there, right? Has this person had um, injuries and do they sit all day? Um, you know, do they move poorly because of postural distortions and, you know, previous lifetime of ankle sprains and sports injuries that haven't totally addressed better balance and better movement following those injuries. We have to look at each one of us as accumulation of every stress we've ever been through. And how can we support um, a body that can recover from our stress? Now, stenosis. I know I'm running through these. We, we good here? Good. Okay, so I want you to understand stenosis is actually, you have these, what are called foramen or holes uh, in the middle of the canal. So if you look at this picture here, we're looking at an axial plane view, looking at this, so we're looking down on a vertebra here. Here's, you know, the facets right here. Here's the spinous. Okay, so here's facets right here where, you know, your vertebra attach from one to the next. Um, and stenosis is where these holes start to get bony buildup around where that nerve exits out. So bony buildup right where that nerve exits is out. Here's spinal cord. See that one that's normal, that big, big hole for the spinal cord to travel through. And that one to the left stenosis where you got bony buildup. Again, why do you get bony buildup? This is a body innately going in to create stability within the spine because there's instability, right? This is an intelligent process. Um, but when you have stenosis, it impacts the nervous system, creates inflammation, and we get pain, right? All of these diagnoses are telling us and telling a story about, you know, how the, the low back has aged over time, the health of the low back, um, and outcome if they don't address it. Now, if anyone has heard of spondylolisthesis, this is where a vertebra slips forward or slips over a vertebra on below it. So if you look at that L5 S1 here, I circled it. See how L5 is shifted forward on the sacrum. Where's the cord there? Yeah, I mean, where's the cord? Cord's right here. What are we concerned about? We want to make sure the cord is healthy and intact. So we see a vertebra slipping forward like this. It's often secondary to a defect to a pars, which is a part of that um, facet. So we see that um, potentially a fracture that allows that vertebra to shift forward um, or it's mechanical instability from degeneration. So the biggest thing is a lot of these are chronic um, and we wanna make sure that, that doesn't progress because there's four, maybe five grades of it if it totally falls off that sacrum, it's grade five. Grade one is where we start to see it inching forward. 
puts a lot of stress on a low back and a system. And so we want to see if we're seeing this at somebody who's 20, 30, we're thinking 50 years from now, we want to maintain where it is, right? Can we put it back? Probably not. You could, you can, I mean, we can, again, with all of these components, as it, when it comes to degeneration, we're looking at how can we stop this from progressing? Um, and then we've got deformities like scoliosis. So here's somebody, you can see how that scoliosis, that lateral curve in the lumbar spine impacts, you know, those femoral heads and those ilium. So this can cause stress to facets, discs, the joints, and then cause stenosis. Here's a kyphosis. This is a deformity in the thoracic spine where we see rounding forward. What causes that? I mean, kyphosis yeah, or the round. Yeah, I mean, again, I would look at, especially with a kyphotic curve, this forward movement. I mean, this is a problem of rep repetition of posture and reinforcing it over and over. Look around you guys, everybody take 20 minutes tomorrow and do some people watching like at a mall or something. And you are going to see a lot of kyphotic curves. It is not pretty. When you see this, when you see this guy right here, you know that when he's walking around like that, that is a brain that's getting poor information, poor processing. This is a stressed brain. This is really unhealthy. And we see this with kiddos. Like we see that with like teenagers, tweenagers, early 20s who are really on their phones a lot. I'm concerned about what 20, 30 years look like for, now, for them. And we're, I mean, we're seeing it with everybody. So life and gravity is if we, I mean, that pulls us forward. So we see that happen over time, but then technology use. So, I mean, these guys, you better give them a chiropractor's name or something. Like you see this, like, you need to go see a chiropractor. They probably have all sorts of things going on. Um, so let's just talk about this and then I wanna wrap up because I know I started late and I'm going over. As we're understanding degeneration, to me, it's telling a story of subluxation that takes place early on in life and it's not addressed. And it's, we're told as a normal process of aging, right? Which we will argue that it's not. But if you go to an allopathic doctor, they will look at treatment for this degeneration that's taking place. And their initial phase of treatment is really pain meds, anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxers. So if this is the problem, let's go back to this. If we're seeing this, you know, if we see one of these many x-rays that I've shown you, if we're seeing this type of degeneration and we're only addressing the pain and the inflammation that's showing up in this person's body, is that going to take care of the problem? Probably not. For all of these, it's going to help manage the pain. And that's the goal. How can we manage the pain and symptoms? We maybe will get physical therapy. And that's typically pretty small dosing of six to 12 visits. And I will tell you, if you have a structure that looks like this guy, you say, well, we're going to give you ex you know, exercise to do. If your structure is there, but you do exercises to bring you back here, but your structure is here, your soft tissue always go to where your structure is. So you can do all the exercise in the world, but if you're not addressing the structure and how it moves, your spine and how it moves and, and doing some corrective work, then your soft tissue work and your exercise are never gonna get you here, right? Now we're gonna bring you here and maintain that, right? So your soft tissues will always go where your structure is. And if you're just trying to get and address this problem in six to 12 visits of physical therapy to address the soft tissue, you're missing a big part of it. There needs to be more. But if initial care doesn't work, then the secondary type scenario we see is steroid injections, right? Chronic problem. We have lots of inflammation. We want to reduce the inflammation, take the pain away. Okay. 
and this further leads to de degeneration. And here's the thing, if you are taking pain medications, does it stop you from doing things that you that hurt you? You know, if you have pain, it's a it's you know an alert said, hey, don't do that. But if you're taking pain meds, you're gonna just keep doing it. You're not knowing you're doing harm. And so really the tertiary um, treatment is surgery. That's what we see. It's really like you get inserted into um, this model of care and we see pain meds, that doesn't work. Injections, that doesn't work. Well, now we're looking at surgery because that's our options. And this is what they say. It's what the MDs say. No operation in any field of surgery leaves in its wake more human wreckage than surgery on lumbar discs. I mean, you realize we now have diagnosis codes for um, what's resulted from post-surgical injury. We have, now have diagnosis codes for that. Um, so how do we change it? And what will it take for us to make a change? Care, not treatment, care, not treatment is the answer. Drug surgeries, hospitals are rarely the answer for chronic health problems. Facilitating our God-given, our inborn healing capacity is really key. Improving diet, exercise, lifestyle are basic. And that's from uh, you know, another MD out of John, John Hopkins. So when you are getting adjusted and you all, majority of you have x-rays, when you are getting adjusted, you are getting appropriate and healthy input into a spine that stops a degenerative process from happening that makes 10, 20, 30 years from now look different. So if you've ever been given one of these diagnoses, I hope it now gives you clarity on what it is, what where maybe came from, and there's things you can do to stop it. So um, I appreciate you being here with me. I know that I, I went long, um, How long is this one? 30 minutes. I just I try and be done by 6.15. So I'm, um, but this is where I'll end here. Uh, this is a chronic issue. Lo many, many people are dealing with this. A lot of them may not know it. Some of them may. Um, and I ask that you be somebody who can be the change and share what you know whether it's bringing someone alongside you to show up to a workshop, whether it's bringing somebody with you to an adjustment or whether it's saying, hey, I think you should get checked. Just get checked. Pain is not normal, it's common. And we know that low back pain is very common. And we need to get people into a different mode of care uh, than what's out there because it's not working. And so that's my ask of you, who can you share this with? I love and appreciate you. Please bring your takeaways to the office when, when you're in next. And um, we'll see you next time. Dr. Mayakin of Monarch Family Chiropractic.